Thank you, John. You know, we, we can still create some room here if you guys uh, want to grab seats. You're good? Okay. Well, I just want to start by uh, thanking John and um, for inviting me to come here to speak about uh, ISIS. Um, as he alluded, I, I've been teaching for two years at the, the War College. Uh, I've been teaching the third iteration of my ISIS course. We also cover other groups like Al-Shabaab and uh, Boko Haram. And, um, but I wanted to open it up beyond just the students and uh, some of the opportunities that I had over here to the broader community. I'm really honored to uh, be here and uh, presenting this. Uh, my intention is to talk for about 40 minutes and open it up. However, I do encourage uh, interruptions. I want this to be more of a dialogue and a discussion. Uh, anything you find uh, interesting, uh, please let, you know, jump in, um, raise your hand, and I will um, uh, address that. What I want to start by is really give you my big uh, uh, takeaways. and Think of that as an executive summary. And then really get into kind of a Middle East overview, uh, ISIS history, strengths and weaknesses, and then assess our current strategy. Uh, and then in the end, provide my two cents on how we could improve it. And that's pretty much what we're going to cover. My four takeaways are that there is no doubt that ISIS appeal is certainly increasing. Uh, it's early in the stage. We've been, uh, we've activated a counter uh, ISIS uh, strategy for about a, a year now. But in that year, uh, progress against ISIS has been slow. And I'll talk more about why and, and exactly how, uh, how slow. Uh, but ISIS as a group, and I use the word ISIS, uh, again, this is interchangeable with ISIL, Daesh, the Islamic State. Sometimes I'll say ISIS, Islamic State. The reason is most Americans know the group as ISIS. Uh, DOD and the White House uses ISIL. The group itself calls itself Daesh, the nation, and there are some other iterations as well. I will use ISIS. Uh, and I will talk about those weaknesses because those are very important to exploit going forward. Where they have overpromised and underdelivered, where they have lost territory. We'll talk more about that. Uh, the main reason the progress against ISIS is slow is we have yet to, from the United States perspective, yet to come up with a clear end state. It's very difficult. Uh, so I have a lot of sympathy for folks who are working on it, precisely because there's so many moving parts. The last 24 hours, Russia conducted 32 airstrikes. Uh, ISIS uh, is moving forward in certain areas. Others is being pushed back by uh, Kurdish forces, for example. Turkey was giving us some support, limited support. Now that support has increased. Th this, these are basically a lot of moving targets, so I understand that. But still having an end state or having that dialogue is very important. So we don't have that right now. I believe we should really take the lead on the counterterrorism effort. But as far as peacemaking, grand, grand bargaining, political reforms, try to support that. Not, don't make that the primary concern. A, we can't afford it. B, we don't have the resources. And C, uh, we can't do it without the folks who are actually involved. So this is, we're talking about the countries, the host nations, and the, and the various neighbors. I'm going to expand on that as well. One of the practical outcomes that I'd like to see is that we really work with not only just one military, the Iraqi military, or try to train some senior rebels, but really try to consolidate all our allies, Arab allies there, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and try to create a peacemaking and keeping force. And the model I'd like to use that we've done a fairly good job with is the African Union troops model uh, in Somalia, for example. And I'll talk about that. That's kind of my on the ground, um, tangible recommendation. We need that for things like border control, but also going forward, stability forces, where they have a regional force that can work. Uh, Notice I didn't say Arab. It has to be multi-ethnic. It has to be other groups uh, and, other, and countries um, across 
uh, the Middle East. If you look at the Middle East today, and this is actually a Central Command uh, map, but the greater Middle East here, you've got uh, parts of South Asia as well. You see a lot of moving targets and a lot of complexity. You've got NATO up working uh, through Turkey and many of our NATO allies, Netherlands, Germany, uh, UK. Got ISIS in Syria. Uh, ISIS expanding through affiliates in uh, South Asia, specifically uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. You've got ISIS in Libya. We're training rebels. We'll talk more about the complexities and challenges of that in Syria. ISIS also in uh, Egypt. They've developed all these different partnerships with local groups. Yemen, uh, attacks inside Saudi Arabia that have been traced back to ISIS, but other groups as well. Let's not forget the Al-Qaeda franchises, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. There is a new regime in Saudi Arabia, uh, a, a new king, a new cabinet, so a lot of things are changing there as well. There's a major civil war going on in Yemen which is also a regional war, a sectarian war. Iran and Saudi Arabia are supporting their respective sects. So the Sunnis are supported by Saudi Arabia. The Shia Houthis are supported by Iran. And then you got President Putin, <laughs> who surprised everybody in the last 48 hours. Uh, he's jumped in pretty strongly. Um, and they're uh, major issues with U.S.-Russia relations. We have issues on Ukraine and now we are in some ways uh, uh, dumbfounded by what the Russians are doing in Syria. We're not sure if that's going to help or hurt. We just cut a deal with the Iranians. Uh, time will tell how successful that will be. Uh, on balance this is supposed to stop uh, or put on hold the Iranian nuclear program. This is all happening in the same area. I'm not even, I haven't even moved beyond this map and you can only imagine uh, how difficult it is to operate. That's why I said you yeah, have a lot of sympathy for folks who are involved in, in drafting and executing policy here. India and Pakistan combined have 220 nukes just a couple of days ago. They had major uh, skirmishes on their border. Uh, there are always a few uh, skirmishes away from uh, uh, mobilizing troops on their borders and that always makes us nervous. It happened in 2008 after the Mumbai attacks, it happened in 2001 and 2002 after um, another terrorist attack. We are very concerned about that and there are some really shady characters there as well. You have Al-Qaeda Central in uh, Pakistan, you have the Haqqani Network, you have groups like Lashkar-e Taiba. They really concern us. They are a direct threat to American homeland. That's the Middle East today. Let's zoom into ISIS and kind of the origins. And the character that really comes to life in this story is Zarqawi, who had a very fundamentally different view from how to um, spread his message of creating a caliphate, of creating a terrorist organization, that would have mass appeal, ideological appeal, but also be able to garner a lot of funds, recruits, and not only just kick out the infidels from the Middle East or become like a vanguard organization like Al-Qaeda inspired, uh, but go way beyond that, but actually start at home, you know, clean at home. Big proponent of getting rid of what he called the Im impure and the worst of the worst, and he was not talking about uh, Americans or their backers. He was talking about Shia Muslims. He starts early, develops a relationship with Al-Qaeda. In the beginning, Al-Qaeda is not too comfortable giving him the franchise card. He applies. Uh, they eventually give up. Um, he fights with Al-Qaeda, obviously loses, runs to Iran, 
then kind of transitions into Jordan, uh, doesn't, conducts a couple of operations against the Jordanian government, early 2000s, after 9-11, not very successful, comes back to Iraq as we go in, sees an opportunity to start a civil war that would not only kick out the Americans, but we'd be able to cleanse Iraq, as in uh, be able to get rid of the majority, which were the Shia. Uh, he goes through different iterations, and he's killed in 2006 at a time when um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq is the official franchise. That's what he's leading. Uh, they've all, Al-Qaeda and uh, what would become ISIS have already developed differences. I will talk in detail about exactly how ISIS is different from Al-Qaeda. But the bottom line is they, they believe in fundamentally different end states and fundamentally different means to get to those end states. He strongly believed in intra-Islamic war, as in Sunni versus Shia. That's where you begin and taking territory, not just using it. Ha not just conducting massive casualty terrorist attacks abroad, but inspiring lone wolves, focusing on the country that he's based in, Iraq, focusing on demoralizing the Iraqi army, playing on the divisions, ethnic divisions that were already existing in Iraq. And he does fairly well, even after he's killed, he's left behind a legacy and insta enough institutional knowledge that the group goes on. They're able to develop their own uh, funding sources and as they do that they become more and more independent and they're able to say no to Al-Qaeda Central when Al-Qaeda Central gets very nervous about them going after Shia. Al-Qaeda says why don't you focus on the American troops and the American backed Iraqi army um, Instead, um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which would become ISIS, continues to focus a lot on the sectarian war. What hurts Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which eventually do declare themselves a state, an Islamic state, the first declaration was in 2006, is the Sunni awakening. And simply put, it is an experiment that we do, we help create by working with Sunni tribes at a time when Sunnis themselves are sick and tired of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They are sick and tired of Al-Qaeda in Iraq because it's a puritanical organization that has a vetting process that would pretty much consider almost every Muslim a non-Muslim. It was very difficult to uh, fulfill the requirements that AQI had. So they would go after Shia, then they would go after liberal Sunnis, then they would go after Sunnis that were more traditional, then they would have subsects. And before you know it, they are killing their own. They are not, uh, their suicide bombing, by definition, is not precise, but it becomes even worse when they don't care at all and they start bombing uh, not only Shia mosques, but also Sunni mosques. At that time, we put in a lot of troops. We support the Sunni tribes, which would later become Sons of Iraq, the Sunni Awakening. And most importantly, we put pressure on Baghdad and we tell them that you have to have a more equitable distribution of political power between the Kurds and the Sunnis and Shias. And the Sunnis that were a minority that were in charge of the country under Saddam Hussein and now already all, all of a sudden find themselves completely out of power. So the, by 2007, the civil wars coming towards the end. The U.S. and allies encourage political reforms and make sure they're sustained. In other words, there is more of an equitable distribution of political power. There's, a, there's discussions on sharing oil revenues. That convinces the minority Sunnis and many of the Sunni tribes to help us and Baghdad. 2011, we leave. But before that, we, we have uh, relative success. We're able to push back AQI from many of these areas, working with those Sunni tribes. And this, in these maps, you can see in December 2006, 2008, those in the back, red means bad. So 
the red has decreased, and those are the areas <laughs> where AQI had strong presence, where they were conducting attacks, where they did have local support. Those things start to change. Now remember, it's not just Sunnis coming out because they're sick and tired. We, they also came, many of those fighters uh, were transferred to the payroll of the Ministry of Interior. In other words, th those are actual formalized militias. Uh, and they were guaranteed money, they were guaranteed a pension system, they were guaranteed a stake. The Sunni officers who did really well under our mentorship, many of our advisors that work under, uh, they were promised that when the promote, time for promotion will come that their sect will not be an issue. That they will be able to get promoted, that they'll be able to get all the jobs that they want as long as they had the merit. All those things slowly start to change as we get out. Surprise, surprise. Remember, look at it from the Shia's perspective. A majority suppressed for decades, now all of a sudden, again, through democratic means, comes to power. Hates the Sunnis for what they did. A civil war is already going on. It has temporarily stopped. We pulled the troops. The US and Iraq are unable to come up with a agreement for US troops to stay. Uh, status of forces agreement, for example. Um, at that time, Prime Minister Maliki of Iraq, now we have more evidence and more analysis on it, had already, has, had already had a close relationship with Iran that wanted us out to begin with. And the Iranians were willing to support him, not only uh, financially and by providing training and now actual troops, but at that time also his extremely repressive uh, political tactics against the Sunnis. So we're gone, the Iranians are backing him, he's the majority. So yeah, a bunch of guys in the beginning get out and they complain about uh, losing jobs. You can see images of very peaceful Sunnis coming out in a very peaceful way and complaining uh, about uh, not getting their civil liberties, political rights, or jobs that were promised. Sons of Iraq, all of a sudden, no income. AQI, which would later become ISIS, takes full advantage of it. They've, uh, they're down but not out. They start to work on Mosul. Mosul has a very interesting dynamic at that time. Again, you don't have to find many reasons to go to war in Iraq. Many of these cities and regions have groups that don't get along. All you have to do is instigate that difference. It's not hard when you're already disenfranchised. Sunnis are disenfranchised. You see other cleavages that you can exploit, and that's what they start. That's where they start. So when people say they took over Mosul in 24 hours, it was a three-year-long campaign, and it really starts with entering uh, and really showing the nice face before you show your bad face. In other words, you work with the communities, you try to exploit the cleavages that are there, you remind them of how terrible uh, Baghdad is, and then you build that resentment, the grievances. And when people get out of line, that's where you become very hard, and you'll see that later on as well. Uh, Sunnis continue to be uh, disenfranchised. Another opening happens as we are leaving is that there is a, uh, there's the Arab Spring, or some would call it the Arab Winter. And you basically see these, on the surface, unplanned form of uh, revolution sprouting out of Tunisia, where people start coming out in Tahrir Square and demanding change, and no longer wanting uh, autocrats or military dictators or even monarchies. Some countries fare well, uh, do well by bribing their citizens like Saudi Arabia or others that don't do too well and, and Mubarak goes away. Tunisia is, is the success story, relative success story because you had uh, in Egypt for example the dic dictatorship came back but in Tunisia there's been uh, a democratic process. Syria the same thing happened. Uh, people got together. Um, President Assad uh, didn't want any of it, and in the beginning stayed quiet, and they were all peaceful. There was no Al-Qaeda, there was frankly very few cleavages at that time. A, a lot of young folks, um, 
wanted change and difference and they w are, were building on what was happening in their neighborhood that we could also get rid of Assad. Remember, Assad is on the uh, part of the Alawite minority community. Okay? He also rules like a king. So now you have these people coming out and saying, we want a difference, we want democracy, we want more representation. His dad was notorious for killing his opposition in a massive way. Uh, and in the past, in the 80s, that's what he did. He bombed the hell out of villages and, uh, and so Assad said, I, I, I'm going to do the same. We, uh, we were in a very precarious situation because the United States was encouraging this change but did, but in the beginning, but then got very nervous about who's going to replace these guys. And then we also had security concerns. So we had a close relationship with the Egyptian military that we've developed for the last uh, six decades. We had to balance that with a legitimate concern for democracy. So our interests and values clash. Surprise, surprise. Happens all the time. Uh, with, with Syria, we thought that Assad would go away fairly soon. Minority sect, small city on the shore, uh, people will rise up, the neighborhood, all these other groups will probably join in. He'll be gone. He's still around. And the reason uh, he was able to do that is because if you look at uh, how civil wars have ended um, in the last 60 years, if you look at the empirical evidence, a lot of research has been done on this, that one of the best ways to end civil wars is a quick, quick swift military uh, victory. If you can't, anything short of that, and the two parties believe that they can't lose, they'll continue to fight. One of the ways they can continue to fight is because they ask for help from outside. So other countries start to get in. Yemen is a very good example. Houthis have their backing uh, from Iran, and the Sunni government that was kicked out has the backing from Saudi Arabia. One of the ways that external powers can help, like the United States, in these civil wars, is to encourage a great bargain. And, but it has to happen at a p time when both parties feel that bargain is better than continuing to fight. You didn't see that there. In fact, that's the time when Al-Qaeda Al in Iraq, which will later become ISIS, moves to Syria. Takes full advantage. In the beginning, uh, they're not very wel welcomed, and Al-Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda's actual affiliate in Syria, is the dominant group. So when ISIS comes to, to Syria, nobody really takes it very seriously. The Free Syrian army is there, several of the groups are there. ISIS did a very good job of uh, exploiting the situation. Um, create, make sure that it fundraises, is able to garner a lot of funds, and is able to strip a lot of people from these other groups and consolidate. Remember their strategy is always taking territory and then establishing themselves as an actual state. Two specific things that they did in 2012 and then 13. They're focused on freeing prisoners. This is not just somebody thinking about this overnight. This is an actual strategy that they thought about. Is to get some of the best guys that are in prison. Remember, some of them are former Baathists. Some of them are former Iraqi uh, um, intel, Iraqi special forces. Uh, Iraqi army guys. And they're able to free a lot of these guys. Others that are outside, they're able to induce them by giving them uh, money and some ideological attraction. And the second thing they do is to make sure that the Iraqi army in Mosul, this is before they take over, is that they hit their morale by constantly instigating an anti-Baghdad sentiment. So you already had citizens, for example, after Mosul was taken over by ISIS, you had regular citizens throwing stones at the Iraqis as they were running away. Two divisions running away, mind you. Some without uniform, some with some uniform, and left all their equipment. These were the two main areas that they focused on. Soon, ISIS is able to dominate the civil war. Again, consolidation, being able to grab as many of the supporters. Now remember, everybody hates Assad at this time, including us. And we've started a covert um, uh, operation to support anti-Assad forces. Saudi Arabia is doing the same, UAE is doing the same, Turkey is doing the same. 
those weapons are ending up somewhere. They're ending up with ISIS, eventually. So the groups that a lot of these countries, including ourselves, were supporting, that's why you see so much reluctance. That's why you see when General Austin and others have testified why screening is so difficult and slow. Because we don't know how much of the weapons uh, will be transferred to the bad guys. So a lot of this goes to them. So that, again, this is again another way that ISIS is becoming stronger. Eventually ISIS and Al-Qaeda have serious uh, differences and Al ISIS says goodbye, does not recognize Al-Nusra Al as Al-Qaeda's uh, official arm, in fact targets uh, Al-Nusra and uh, officially launches the caliphate in June of 2014. Dramatically takes over Mosul. But like I said, it was a three year campaign. In Syria, it starts in August 2012, starts to build up. By March 2013, it has major areas where it's operating. And more recently, in these. There have been some setbacks, and uh, ISIS has lost territory, no doubt about it. Kobani uh, in Syria, Tikrit in Iraq. However, generally speaking, the trend line is that it is progressing. So the strategy is not just 35,000 troops and a lot of foreign fighters, well played, battle ridden, and they have sophisticated weapons. Most of them are, if you look at their videos, it's our Humvees and our weapons that they have captured, which we give to the Iraqis and the Iraqis hand it to them. They do mass casualty attacks, but they also, specifically targeting the Shia, uh, but they also really work hard on demoralizing the uh, Iraqi uh, military and the Syrian military. Uh, Mosul and Ramadi are good case studies where you can see that ISIS has taken full advantage of weak governance. But it's also uh, applied other tactics like extortion, kidnapping. So it's, it's the good and the bad that they bring. Uh, they look at an area and a region where they see a minority group or a majority group in that area that feels disenfranchised from the central government, promises them something better, or frankly, if they're weak enough, just take, them, take over that territory. And then institute their form of governance within the short term, some things get done, frankly. Objectively speaking, they get certain things done. Picking up garbage, they subsidize bread right away. I, I emphasize that because that goes a long way in these areas. They'll subsidize food. Um, they will implement a very, very brutal form of swift justice. If you're happy with it, it, it was fast. If not, on the other side, you're going to be in trouble. But bottom line is gets done. Uh, they've got a lot of foreign fighters coming in, and they've hired some of the best. Like I said, former Iraqi special forces, intel guys. You can see some of their videos, some of the literature that has come out. Some of the best planning that's gone in, very professional. Some of the guys, frankly, that we uh, either interrogated or actually trained. Oil, it's always good to have that. It's always good to have an area where you can exploit the criminal syndicates, where you can smuggle, where you can um, uh, kidnap, uh, extort, uh, receive charity, uh, fundraise. Life under uh, ISIS. Some of the, f some of the sh services are fast and efficient. Uh, some of the surveys that have been done. Um, some of the tribal disputes, for example. And again, ISIS is smart, so they'll go into areas and try to start by showing their nice face. Uh, they do fairly well with municipal um, policing, for example. Uh, basic things like traffic control, uh, garbage pickup. A lot of these things in Raqqa, for example, is, is the capital there of the Islamic State. You can, you can look at that. Uh, court system is fairly fast. Education is questionable, obviously, and disturbing. Um, they have these aid-based services, uh, food aid, uh, postal services. Uh, they've developed some form of a currency. They have uh, a credit bureau exploitation, uh, anti-exploitation system. 
Um, they, uh, a, a good case study is really to look at Mosul, how they were able to actually take over. Um, there were multiple suicide attacks on all on different directions, from different directions uh, when they came into Mosul, which uh, at the very beginning, not only were they able to establish surprise, but the Iraqi army split, thinking that they were coming from one direction, when in actuality that, that whole thing was deception. Uh, some minority protection, but you know, we all have heard about the Yazidi uh, sex slaves. Uh, they have instituted slavery now. Uh, it's very disturbing, um, but they they had a they have magazines and forums where they have this discussion. They they had a uh, PR event where they they had a, a question and answer of why uh, why they legalized slavery and why it was good for the state. Uh, and that kind of brings me to probably one of the greatest trends, which is their communication strategy when it comes to getting their message out there and recruitment. Social media we've all heard of, radio messaging, pamphlets, uh, also traditional things like spreading the messages through their uh, network of mosques. Uh, and they have certainly spread. Uh, they have established themselves in Libya, uh, Egypt, all the way into Afghanistan. Uh, the kind of interior ring, the near abroad, and the far ring, and also inspired attacks all over all over the world, basically, but all, certainly Europe, Australia, and and within the Middle East. The strengths are really the three A's: the approach, the appeal, and the actions. What do they do? The best way. To explain this is to contrast ISIS with Al Qaeda. So, Al Qaeda. Uh, Al Qaeda, if you look at all their literature and correspondence from UBL to his deputies, you see a general theme, which is that we are preparing the groundwork that would allow us to eventually declare a state. But that is way, way out there in the future. Right now, we need to get some very pragmatic things out of the way, which is get all U.S. or Western forces out of the Middle East Holy Land. And when they're out, second, and sometimes in peril, kick out and get rid of all local leaders that are pro-Western or supported by the West, specifically uh, the United States. Caliphate later. Uh, End of days is a general theme in both organizations. But for Al-Qaeda, it was the groundwork before the end of days is more important and it will take a long time before the end of days come. Uh, like other Judeo-Christian religions, there is a lot of uh, uh, religious ideology behind that of, of whatever the sacred uh, texts of these religions talk about what, when, and how end of days will come, the different prophecies. And for Al-Qaeda, it was an academic question, something you want to think about, but it's far away. Focus on killing Americans and Westerners. That should be the focus. Everybody else cut a deal. And the whole narrative was about victimhood. Remember, um, the U.S. came, took over the Holy Lands, we lost the wars to Israel. Um, nobody cares about the plight of the Muslims. You know, that's the narrative. Just look at the last 30 years. You know, it's a lot of victimhood. A lot of lecturing from a lot of old guys. Uh, if you look at some of their um, literature, very outdated, very baby boomer-like, uh, not very technologically savvy. Inspiring young people, but not nearly as ISIS, and I'll tell you why. So a lot of lecturing. You use territory, and, and preferably mountains and places you can just hide. Um, you, don't, you don't govern territory, that's stupid. You make yourself obvious, right? Uh, if ISIS has a traffic cop, I can see him. Uh, no, you gotta completely blend in. You're the fish in the pond. Um, and you use that territory. You use medical services, you recruit, you do the you know, monkey bars once in a while, you make a video. That's about, 
And uh, you use it. You don't take over. You don't like create a government. And what you need to focus on are big projects. You know, the 9-11s, the mini 9-11s, something dramatic. Keep the movement alive. That's how the money comes in, recruits come in, story goes on. You know, we're the rebels and the evil empire. Uh, and once in a while the rebels will attack and people love Luke Skywalker. So that's kind of the general story. Um, and have uh, spectacular attacks. Uh, but have few of them, they have to be very spectacular. In other words, uh, USS Cole and others that I talked about. ISIS, different. Caliphate now. Fundamental difference in the end goal. Uh, this is our country, the country that's going to turn into a state. This is the Islamic State. We've created it. We're going to run it. And we're going to use this territory. We're going to take it. Not just use it, but take it. <coughs> An end of days is coming close. We're doing this to prepare ourselves for the great <coughs> battle, the great crusade. But it has to start with Shia first, as in fellow Muslims, before anything else. Uh, a, they're easily available. Um, they're right there. Most, uh, if you look at all the suicide bombings, you know, 80 to 90 percent of them Muslim uh, victims. Um, and that will galvanize the, the brutality and, and be able to attract uh, people. And then, of course, we will focus, they say, we will focus on, on the U.S. And we would like the U.S. to actually come there because it's always good to have troops on your own territory to fight them rather than uh, to conduct very, very difficult uh, operations against American homeland. They believe in victory. Screw the victimhood. All those boring stories about, now we have a piece of land that is the size of the United Kingdom. We've got our own traffic police and our own currency and our own uh, passport. And we, we own it. We have our, this is our territory. We live the way we want to live. And we've taken over two countries. We have great partnerships. It's victory. Look at their videos. They have 4K video now coming out. Uh, they, ha they, they, they had a video when they took over Mosul and Ramadi that they took from a drone. And you should just look, watch the video. It's like a Hollywood trailer. Act. We act. We don't just lecture. Something has to happen. Something will happen. Wait for God. No. Act. You can do it now. You want Aleppo? There's a plan for it. You want Mosul? You want Ramadi? You want most of Anbar? There's a plan for it. Rocky military has serious problems. Let's exploit them. Iraq as a whole has serious problems, let's exploit them. They act. They take territory. They don't just use it. They have a military campaign. You look at their military campaign. Very sophisticated. They were able to hire, like I said, some of the best consultants. Uh, many of their guys uh, are former Iraqi military. They have an actual campaign. Not just like uh, three or four IEDs, five uh, suicide bombs. No, what, what about the day after? What do we do? No, we got to go in. And I'll tell you a little bit about how they walked into Mosul and the kind of public announcements that they did. They, they came out with a strategic plan that they implemented. They created small municipal uh, uh, departments, you know, from garbage collection to post, uh, uh, you know, mail, postal mail. As far as lone wolves and other attacks, yeah, we're, we're going to spend some time thinking about the next 9-11, but that's not going to be our focus. Focus is really going to be consolidation, and then we'll let the lone wolves in Europe, Australia, uh, uh, and even the United States uh, do these smaller attacks, and that's good enough. That keeps us alive. But what really keeps us going is that we have a state. So those of you in the back, that's the Islamic State, and that little guy is Al-Qaeda, and he says, step aside, boy. Yes, sir, quick yeah, question. Yes. Um, so how do, you, how do the Al-Qaeda affiliates, say AQIM, AQAP, how do they then reconcile such fundamental differences, yet still pledge allegiance to ISIS? So uh, 
no, not a single group, the main groups, have pledged dual allegiances. Al-Shabaab is Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram is ISIS. Uh, and they have, so they, you don't have one group that is, uh, is saying that Al-Qaeda and ISIS are both. Remember, there's also a fundamental problem, leadership. Baghdadi versus uh, Zawahiri. Yeah. So, and, and not only do they not like each other, you can't, you know, no group is saying that either one of them uh, is the commander of the faithful. There can only be one. So, both are trying to appeal. Right now, ISIS is doing a much better job. It's been able to strip away a lot of allies from Al-Qaeda, including funding sources. So they're in a, the, uh, Al-Qaeda is in a real pickle. They tried to start a new organization in India. That hasn't really done too well. Um, they tried to reach out. They send emissaries to Boko Haram before they signed the, the contract with ISIS, trying to lure them away. They did the same thing with the Egyptian group, and the Egyptian group went with ISIS. Uh, again, remember ISIS is bringing a, a bag of goodies, trainers, recruitment, the latest, just the latest strategic communication gear. I mean, if you look at Boko Haram videos before and after ISIS, it'll just tell you just that has been great. Um, and so they will bring these things to these guys, and, most, and right now they're winning pretty well. Al-Qaeda does not want to fight fellow Muslims, does not want to kill Shias. It has a different perspective, vanguard movement, Caliphate later, apocalypse later, focus on these illegitimate regimes and going after American troops. Very different perspective from, from, from ISIS. Uh, again, actionable jihad, action over rhetoric. ISIS roadmap. Vote. You gotta start with intra-Islam, inside Islam, clean house. And then the rest, secondary. You, wanna, you definitely want to weaken already extremely weak Iraqi and Syrian institutions and militaries. Every time they win, that demoralizes the military on the other side. Execute highly visible terrorist attacks, send message to friends and foes. The FBI, former FBI director called it this new form of, of outside called crowdsource terrorism where they're able to uh, inspire attacks, lone wolf attacks, by sending out a message and hoping enough people would say yes. And all, all you need is, is a very small number of people. Um, and, and, and continue to expand. And if you can't expand, you certainly want to consolidate. And that's kind of where they are. There is, uh, there's a kind of a strategic stalemate right now with, with the ISIS uh, ISIS is doing fairly well, and we'll talk about exactly why that is. What would work, what would really help the movement right now if we were to, in their perspective, they would really want U.S. troops on the ground. And that galvanizes uh, the people, local people. Uh, that certainly provides more targeted, uh, targets. It's easier to attack. If Now, the argument can go both ways, too, because if you just airstrikes are not enough either. So what do you do? It's a very, very complicated situation. Mm -hmm. These are some of the uh, attacks they've done and then also areas they've taken over. Foreign fighters. Sir, yes. before you get into that, can you just go back for a second and clear up in the history of ISIS and the very, their very genesis. Because Al Wahiri tried to get money from Al-Qaeda and failed. Where was their initial bankroll to become this effectively superpower in their territory? Where did it generate from? What, where did it come from initially? I know where it comes from now. Yeah. No, so Z Zawahiri did get the initial money, but it was not to start a new organization in 2001. Huh. He went, he, want, he, he was very fixated on Jordan, then moves to Iraq, and it has taken a long time. It's been about eight, nine years to be here. So this money wasn't just given to them. The recent flow of the last two years, a lot of that has come from oil smuggling and actually taking over banks. A lot of these cities had banks with, with actual currency that they were able to take over. Then they, the, uh, f they have extortion, they have uh, taxation, they, uh, they're really in tune with the black market, and the U.S. Treasury Department is working very hard on, on stemming some of that flow. And so that's why we've been able to uh, attack some of the oil refineries. So now that 
uh, the oil that they're able to export is less refined. That means the value goes down. So we have had some success in taking some of their uh, funding away. But they just did really well. And when they did that, when they consolidated a lot of these other groups, they brought money with them as well. Going back to their initial operation was to uh, free a lot of the military consultants from prison and so on and put them on salary. Where did those initial funds come from? Best some, year, best year now? Some, some of this you have to remember that the bar is very low. I mean, these guys were talking about 100 bucks a month, uh, 200 bucks a month. And so these guys, especially the former sons of Iraq who were on payroll and kicked out and then completely, I mean, these guys are desperate as well. Also, remember that the some of the most valuable people are worth all the money. So they were making some very smart decisions on who to provide support. Uh, when they would go into these areas and free these prisoners, chances are they've already taken over part of the city and a bank was part of that deal. Foreign fighters uh, increasing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to wrap this up because I do definitely want this to be more of a discussion um, because there are some areas. F Americans going to ISIS or joining ISIS, that number has increased. Uh, these numbers come directly from the Armed Services Committee uh, and Department of Homeland has just conducted a new investigation and they made uh, this report public. A lot of these guys are coming from the Middle East, but there are significant numbers coming from UK, 700, 250 from the US, and uh, over, uh, over 1,500 from France. Uh, now, remember, those guys have passports that don't need an American visa. There's also a refugee crisis, which is a terrible humanitarian crisis. We will be taking in 85,000 80, um, this year. Next year, we're going to be taking 100,000. Screening is very important to make sure that, um, that our economy can handle it, but also that, um, that the safety uh, of the United States is taken care of. So we, there, there's a lot going on over there as well. But I just wanted to give you a general idea where this number has definitely gone up to 25,000 this year. Yes? Uh, would that number include women, like American women traveling to Syria? Yes. Okay. Fewer, but the ones who are part of it, uh, yeah, they, they've studied them. Look. Again, this number is very low compared to some of our allies, but the number has increased in the last 12 months. Why? One of the reasons is this PR campaign. They do really well. Uh, they use social media for recruitment. Remember, they're trying to make you feel that, that life sucks and life with them is better. That's one message. Uh, they're also targeting people with very low self-esteem, sometimes very strong ideological leanings, and other times just fee people who don't fit in. If you look at gang mentality, let's get out of the ISIS for a second, and you look at some of the uh, Bloods, for example, in Crips in, in California, a lot of good work has been done on, on the police side, policing side in the U.S. And you look at these case studies, you can see the kind of people that usually come in. It's, it, the gang mentality is there. It's, it's a sense of purpose. It's a sense uh, that your life means something. It's also incentives, money. Sometimes you're, you're, you're guaranteed things like, uh, like a wife, uh, a, a, a house that will be provided for you. Uh, if you felt uh, that you didn't belong anywhere else, when all of a sudden you'll have your own state. And you should look at the, some of the pamphlets and recruitment that they do. And then they help you throughout the process. Hey, you've got an American uh, passport. Come to Turkey. Turkish Intel will ask you this. Just walk down here, a car will come, pick us up from there. They're using all kinds of encryption uh, on forums, things like that. Uh, so if you follow the trail, you can see it's a very sophisticated system that makes you feel really good. Now, of course, there are defectors, right? The buyer's remorse, guys who get out or women who get out and they're like, wow, this is not what I wanted. This is definitely not what I need. Also, there, uh, think about religious cults inside the US. They use the same kind of mentality as well. <coughs> they work very closely with keeping the morale up. Uh, you can see some of their strategic communication that's really targeted towards making sure that people are well rested, that they have a vacation package, that they have some kind of um, uh, pension system, uh, that, that they constantly b help them feel that they are part of a state, even though it might be all you know, hogwash. Uh, they work on governance. There's a hierarchy. There's a system. Uh, 
And they're really focused on military campaigns. They, they market the hell out of it when they take over these areas. That helps them a lot. They, they make videos out of them and then they uh, show them in um, uh, these cinemas that they built up pretty much in, in the middle of the city by using a projector. And they'll have like a nice little family picnic and then they'll put a big video on of how great we're doing. Um, uh, that helps with recruitment. Um, they'll, they're doing some, I saw a video where they lined up a lot of Europeans and I think there was one American in a very dramatic way they all take their passports out and burn them and then they laugh and they dance and then they sing and then we finally made it to the promised land. I mean, they, they do all kinds of things. But there are also a lot of weaknesses. Um, it's uh, no country for all men. And uh, what happens is after a while, if you don't make the cut, and uh, it's always hard. If you're a puritanical regime and you think, yes? How easy, what you just said, how easy is it to defect? And given the idea that you have <coughs> passports, you said, and <coughs> even a postal system, how does that work internationally? I mean, the passport, I would imagine, is not accepted in many places, so it's not much use. Yes. You can't exactly go to your vacation yes. in Miami, you know? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, I don't know. No, they many them. times, many times they will, most of the defections have happened if they've been able to cross the border into Turkey. Uh, and they will uh, just lie about going somewhere and then just defect. Um, but it's very difficult, especially for women, because they're closely watched. Now, in the beginning we had an issue. We had at, at one time over a thousand UK citizens. Some of them wanted to defect. There was the, the MI6 and MI5 was worked very closely to create a de-radicalization um, program that would allow UK citizens that went to ISIS now have second thoughts that they can still come back home and many of them have been able to come back. In the US uh, we've had, uh, and I talk a lot about that, uh, we, we were also working on a system to encourage people that uh, to come back but to go through a de-radicalization uh, program uh, and the Brits have been doing it for way longer because they've had this problem. Uh, there's a very heavy price of utopia. You over promise and you ha eventually under deliver because they are under a lot of pressure. There have been over 7,000 airstrikes since we started uh, airstrikes against them. Um, every time they say that they are indestructible, uh, they also make themselves vulnerable uh, to the fact on the ground when they lose territory. How do they explain that? Um, and so this is very difficult uh, for them. And, and that's something they're still toying with. A lot of religious scholars who've actually studied the original caliphates and looked at uh, Islamic jurisprudence have come out against them by saying that what you're doing is, is a bunch of baloney. None of this has actual uh, theological backing. So now they have to to fight on that front too, and they don't do too well when they take the texts out of context and things of that nature. So there's a real struggle going on trying for legitimacy beyond the areas that they control. It is probably the first time in the Middle East the Israelis, the Iranians, the Saudis, and the U.S. are on the same page when it comes to ISIS and Russians. So that uh, is not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Um, not th got a good thing for them. So this is one of their weaknesses that they've, they've pissed off a lot of people that didn't really like each other for a long time. And then defections. They have been defections. They've come back. They've uh, shared very interesting intelligence about how the Islamic State works, what some of the vulnerabilities are. The current strategy uh, of the White House uh, really comes down to about nine lines of effort and about five working groups. And I, I just want to quickly look into that. Um, I'm, go I'm going to go a little bit over, it seems. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to, to cover this topic, right? I mean, so y y the, the first is supporting effective governance in Iraq. Um, we've done some good. Maliki's gone. Hedri's here. He is working on bringing the Shia, you know, making sure Shia and Sunni get along better. Uh, he is tr making sure that it's more of a pluralistic uh, uh, governance system, uh, more fair. We're not doing too well with ISIL safe haven. Um, most of the territory they still have, with a few exceptions. 
Uh, we are building partner capacity, but when it comes to the Syrian rebels, it's embarrassingly low. When it comes to the Iraqis, they still have to test. Tikrit was, was, was a C. Um, build, enhancing intelligence, this is a serious issue. You, you must have heard about the intel uh, analyst of CENTCOM that have come out and said that our bosses are changing our assessments, that it's not as rosy as, we, as they think it is. State Department yesterday said that we have stopped using CENTCOM analysis. Um, they've shifted away and they've actually, it was in a very public way that they did that. So this is very disturbing. Uh, disrupting ISIL's finances, so we're doing a better job on that. Uh, Treasury Department is working closely. The true nature, this is the counter narrative. Again, we're struggling with that. Um, how, to not, how to convince folks to, to show kind of the grim face. The flow of foreign fighters, again, not doing very well on that. Uh, protecting the homeland, uh, so far, fairly good. Uh, we've got a FBI that has at least 20, 30 years of experience on that. They've been working very closely with local communities since 9-11, so we have a, a very good system within the United States, but we still have to work harder on it. Humanitarian support, uh, again, not doing as, as much as we could. Uh, again, that's also debatable. On the working groups, military efforts, by the way, the working group is, is, uh, is headed by General Allen. Unfortunately, he has said that he will be resigning in December. Some have said he's frustrated. Uh, because he doesn't have the resources. He's kind of the, the civilian point man out there who's handling bigger anti-ISIS operations, working with our allies. Military efforts, uh, not so well. Stopping the flow of foreign fighting, not so well at all. Uh, better, I guess, uh, from a, a few months ago, but generally under-resourced. Counter-finance efforts, better. Working with Italy and Saudi Arabia. Stabilization efforts, kind of very general things. but. Um, Counter messaging, again, very, a big problem there as well. So I, with a few exceptions, not too well. Not too well. Uh, but there have been some successes, and we have, those are facts, and we have to mention them. Uh, you know, 7,000 airstrikes, we've spent about 3.5 billion. Uh, we've trained about 10,000 Iraqi troops, 2,000 uh, specifically focused on counterterrorism. 125 Syrian rebels, yes, I know the ones who are actually fighting, according to General Austin, are only four or five. And that is very, very disturbing. But still, um, we, we helped the uh, Iraqi army take uh, back uh, that have been charged and 10 have been arrested this year so there's been some aggressive moves in the United States uh, it's always hard in this situation where our money could easily end up with the wrong guys uh, these major issues with uh, problems with intelligence Again, CENTCOM analyst, yes. I'm sorry, yes. It would appear that their religion is one of their major problems. You know, they kill each other. And uh, is, have you ever worked in that direction to maybe get those guys together? The, the For us, really. As in finding a... Yeah, get, get away from this hatred they have for... Each other, yes. That, that, that's always, when we work closely with the Iraqi government, that's what we're trying to do is to, uh, the State Department and Department of Defense trying to encourage them to get along, frankly. Uh, when it, and and that's, 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 uh, that's been a project. It's hard to do that when you have very few troops and you've m moved away all the resources that were available at one point. Uh, so it's very difficult to do it, but that, that's definitely part of the strategies. Just at this moment not yielding positive results because it just doesn't have that kind of effect. Before you finish, can you at least say something about the Western influence? And yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, like I said, General Allen is resigning and you know this is uh, problematic because news stories are coming out that, that he is not happy with the White House. 
and that's not good. Uh, but but the Russians are tricky. Uh, we just got some information in the open source media that they did indeed target the Al Nusra Front, which is Al Qaeda's affiliate. But close to the Al Nusra Front were some of the what's broadly known as a Free Syrian Army. They also attacked uh, folks that are going after Assad. Russia has made it very clear that they want President Assad to stay in power. And that is a problem for us because while we don't want him gone before we do anything, which was our old stand, the red lines we let him cross, now we want it in parallel. That's what uh, Secretary Ash Carter said. In parallel, uh, bring about change in the government. In other words, Assad needs to go and continue to put pressure on ISIS. The Russian influence right now is all up in the air. We can't tell the net. The net result is unclear at the moment. It's fairly new. Has the State Department indicated where they're going to go for their intel now? Uh, they, they have in-house IR, what is it, IRB, IR and IR, and, and I, uh, they, didn't, they didn't specify. This was a completely public forum where they, they showed their frustration. Mm -hmm. Yes? Hey, sir, Garth Kimseth from the Senior Course. Um, we all talk about Bashar al-Assad you know, being kicked out, but the one thing that I think that we haven't gotten the hint on for the last 10 years is, okay, who do we put in place? Or exactly. who do we want in place when he's gone? And I've never, ever, ever heard that. And then, um, are there any moderate militias that we would back um, for a government in Syria as they stand right now? Second question, no. There's not a single one. Uh, frankly, there's not even a single one, even if uh, that, that, is, that can work with us, is strong enough. If ISIS would turn tomorrow, we would grab it right away. It's the most effective force. Uh, everyone else we've worked with. This is an actual quote. Uh, we've trained 125, currently fighting. We're talking four or five. General Lloyd Austin Commander, U.S. Central Command. This just happened. This is the reality of the situation. But you're absolutely right. One of the reasons why we are reluctant to go after Assad aggressively is because we don't know who will replace him. Isn't it true that that would just create a power vacuum? Exactly. So what we're working on is a hybrid. And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about is a hybrid where he stays in power for a little bit, and we encourage a transition. So we are actually moved away from our stand of going after Assad. And we're hoping that it will be, it will be slower, it will be imperfect, uh, but will be better than leaving the vacuum. But you know, again, I can, I can make these slides available. This, uh, I can skip this part, but this is basically the State Department's uh, public diplomacy, public affairs uh, secretary talking about how difficult it is to have a counter narrative. He says the UAE is reticent, the Brits are over eager, and the working group structure is confusing. When we convene meetings with our counterparts, I'm certain we all heard about various initiatives for the first time. This memo is from June of this year. Again, I can make this available. The, go the good really is that we've pushed back to ISIS on some of these issues. Uh, part, the bad is is that it's still control of Mosul, Ramadi, uh, regional partners are reluctant to act decisively, and the ugly is when all of this spills over. And I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about Lebanon, Jordan, Algeria. I'm very concerned about it. Civil wars usually spill over. Civil wars can also become much worse when others join in. Think of Yemen, think of Libya right now. When you look at the alternatives, and in some ways this is great because you have a presidential race going on, so you have Republicans and Democrats coming up with their own <laughs> different plans. Some have really said go big and back to the future. These are the guys who want, you know, surge part two, uh, take all those guys. It's, it's a small minority because Americans don't have the appetite for another 150,000 troops that will be deployed, let alone 20 or even 10,000. Uh, then you have uh, folks who are looking at Iraq first, Syria later. Yes. What do you mean that Brit the Brits are over eager? What does that mean? They want results quicker? Is that what they mean? What does it mean? It, f my interpretation of what he wrote is that they uh, certainly wouldn't want results early than later, and they are um, much more. Other people don't want it, results? Uh, the other people that we are working with is difficult. We have issues within the U.S. government where DOS and DOD, DOD is not talking to each other, and then we have issues with our Arab allies that have different uh, agendas and sometimes extremely slow in reacting. Well, 
If Assad were eliminated, would that uh, solve the problem? No, it will not. It, uh, then you have, okay, Iraq first, Syria later. Uh, fix Iraq first, that's where we got, that's where we are experiences, that's where an actual army exists. Uh, forget Syria, there's a civil war going on, it's very sad, they'll kill each other, uh, and we'll just uh, go after the remnants. Uh, ISIS now, Assad later. Uh, go after ISIS, Assad can just stick around and then he'll just die his own death. Uh, that's another one. Create safe zones, Petraeus, Clinton, and then most recently Bill Clinton talked about it. Create a little safe zone, build on that, in that safe zone, very close to Kobani, train uh, Syrian rebels, train them as in train the trainer, don't just train a bunch of them, just train a few of them, then send them out, let them create the little companies, um, and then we can then c continue to expand in these safe zones. Uh, babysit for decades, uh, this is literally uh, s not only bringing a lot of truths, but staying there forever as the constant referee. Uh, nobody has appetite for that one. Uh, let the neighbors clean their mess. Uh, def I, I, I think there's some truth to that, uh, encouraging more of the, our allies to work together so they can help us. Uh, let Russia clean the mess. In fact, I think uh, was it, uh, it was Donald Trump who recently said that. Uh, let, let Europe clean the mess, right? Uh, let, let, uh, let them clean the mess. Anyways, I, in my humble opinion, I think we should definitely take the lead on counterterrorism. But everything else, I kind of group it together as peacemaking and keeping. And for that, I think the only thing we can do is support. So encourage these countries to have an internal dialogue about political reform. How are they going to share resources and political power? That's what it really comes down to it. You have to feel like an Iraqi. You can't feel like you are part of small little areas uh, and you have nothing to do with the government. And the only way they can feel ownership is if they, if they have the feeling that they're going to get somewhere with that ownership. And you don't have that in Iraq, you don't have that in Syria, you don't have that in Libya, you don't have that in Yemen. In order to do that, we need to support that. Uh, reduce the clear and present danger on the U.S. homeland. Definitely take the lead on that. Everything else, support it. Uh, and then one other thing that I would really like on a kind of pragmatic way is to work w on the model of the African Union troops. We've done amazing things with the, these guys in Somalia and other places in North Africa where uh, a local Middle Eastern force then takes over some of these responsibilities from border patrolling to stabilization force uh, and then mitigation of many of the civil wars. And you could kind of see that on the map where I've, uh, and troop numbers and things. Yes? Looking at what you had up there for a goal, as well as, you know, so the previous slide where we talked about the different options. What is ISIS or ISIL's actual aspirations against the United States? What is our threat from ISIS, which in order really should dictate what you know, avenues we're going to use to go against them? The threat to homeland is certainly there, but it's second to our interest in the Middle East, which really focuses on not only uh, the safety of our allies, but more importantly, oil. And it threatens all the, uh, the, the countries that are not only allies but also producing oil. So Iraq and Libya are suffering massively. Libya lost 90, uh, is down to 93 percent down from its uh, heyday of, of three, uh, 3 million barrels per day. Uh, Iraq is down as well. Uh, even with shell oil and the so-called energy independence, for, uh, the next foreseeable future we definitely need uh, Middle Eastern oil. And we need Middle Eastern oil not only for us, but also the world economy to be more stable. Plus, we've got key allies, Jordan, Israel, um, and countries we've spent a lot of treasure and blood in. So those are kind of things that, that are making us stick around and, and, and coming up with, uh, admittedly, a very difficult uh, strategy to, to win this. Yes. I, I can't imagine I'm the only person that's thought of this, so I'm hoping that you'll have a perspective on it as well. This huge humanitarian crisis coming out particularly out of Syria spreading to the western nations of Europe spreading in the next two years 185,000 strong to the US isn't that an awful lot like spreading a wildfire with gasoline and yes how, is there a way to no, I, all those people can't be seeking democratic peaceful lives I mean, yes they, they just can't. but the whole the but the the evidence suggests that the mass majority of them 
uh, are truly refugees. These are not sleeper cells. And in order to make sure that those sleeper cells don't slip in, we have a very aggressive homeland security FBI driven program. And they're going through a lot. That's why we're taking very, very few people and slowly. Germany is taking 800,000 this year alone. But they've had a, a very good domestic screening system for the last uh, 15 years. Ours is pretty good. Remember, immigrants do really well in this country in the big numbers. They come from all over the world and they, they become Americans when they respect and obey the American Constitution. That's what it is. There's no Americanness beyond that. The Constitution, that's what we give them. We expect them to obey it. If they don't, they are repercussions. Uh, and generally speaking, across Asia, Africa, others, remember there's, there was a time when we were taking a lot of Somalians and the major problem with Al-Shabaab was there. We, and we have a very good FBI system that's working on. But it's a real concern. Screening is a real concern. Yes? This African Union pattern force that you're talking about, what would be the religious composition and how would it play out in the Middle East? Mm, very good. Exactly. That's why I said Middle Eastern. Because it's not just so a, even yeah, even, even, yeah, it's even not. The Middle East problem is because of the Shia Sunni divide. Yes. What now, the composition, of this the composition has to be, uh, equitable to the countries that are contributing. So the border states will certainly contribute and the model will be their domestic military. So in Iraq, for example, you have Shia Sunni inside their military. Um, you, have the, you have similar mixed groupings within many of these militaries. Um, Egyptian military is another one. So the composition will have to be in a way, like again, the, we had similar issues with the African Union troops. Because over there, if you don't have sect, you have major tribes, you have major issues with the Kenyans and the Somalians and others. So this is, an, this is something that they'll have to look into and, and, the, and, and it will be uh, something they'll have to come to a consensus with. But it will have to reflect the concerns of the people. Iran is truly concerned and is very vehemently anti-ISIS. It has deployed actual troops, uh, militias, and its intelligence wing, including its own proxy proto-state Hezbollah. So definitely wants to focus on it. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Sunni. The composition will have to be part of that consensus. Absolutely. Uh, yes. How bad is the, uh, is the divide between the Shia and the Sunni? Is it to the, to the point where a Shia will not uh, be part of a unit that's commanded by a Sunni or the, or the other way around? No, no, not at all. Again, the, these groups like ISIS, what they will do is that's their job to make sure that it appears that way, that uh, Sunni and Shia, uh, Shia could never work together. But throughout the Middle East, you will see many examples of them working together in government, in military. What happens is when a Shia government in Baghdad in 2011 and 2012 start to discriminate on, on the matter of sect promotions, um, salaries, um, jobs, um, getting a house in a certain neighborhood, uh, and those things then r create major resentment which then turn into or is exploited by groups like ISIS that make it much more violent. By definition, not at all. Many of these countries, uh, Pakistan is a good example, 190 million people, predominantly uh, Sunni country with 120 nuclear warheads, mind you, has 20 million Shias. There is an issue of violence against the Shia, but nowhere even close to the kind of civil wars we just discussed. Uh, and many of them in many of the urban areas are living coincidentally, and the Shia are well represented in state institutions and the military. They are problems, but nowhere even close to. Relatively speaking, much better. Yes. Uh, with respect to ISIS, there are those that believe that their ideology is essentially their weakness, meaning that if they don't hold territory, the idea of being you know, a caliphate now, and, and that gives them their legitimacy, that somehow by, if we take back that territory, you know, unlike Al Qaeda, they're not just going to melt into the, you know, into the background where we, we can't be having an insurgency on our, on our hands. So are those that believe that really the key is to, to essentially take back that territory that they've gained and that, that will simply you know, eradicate the problem of ISIS. I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Is that 
just an oh, it's not that simple, or is it? Is there really some some you know weight behind that argument? It it definitely has a lot of weight because that's one of the major distinctions between ISIS and Al Qaeda, that they take territory that they have actually declared a caliphate, that they actually have a piece of land that they call their own. For them to lose massive territory would certainly um, hit them hard with recruitment, uh, funding, uh, operations, no doubt about that. Uh, they will then have to find a way to justify becoming a regular terrorist organization. Remember, it's more of a proto-state now. Uh, so you're absolutely, I, I think th what's, what's hard is is how do you kick them out when they're part and parcel of the people living there? In other words, you can't kick out ISIS and keep the grievances. You can't kick out ISIS from all these areas and still have Assad and still have Sunnis feeling disenfranchised and still having economic disparity and no political reform. They're going to come back in a different form. This is, this is going to be a whack-a-mole. In order to stop that, you have to have fundamental political reform. My argument is we can't do it for them. We can help them, support them. In the meantime, we need to have the neighborhood take full responsibility and, ha and create their own watch, uh, watch group. And that's where the African Union uh, troops in Somalia model uh, to have a Middle Eastern stabilization force comes in. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Rick Hewitt from the senior course. Um, one of the things you're talking about, the, the politics involved you know, with it, and you can't remove one without dealing with the other. One of the things I saw in, in your in your recommendation, one of the things that it does not address is the Cold War going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, the Sunni and the Shia that's taking place through their proxies, with the U.S. sitting on the side of Saudi Arabia and the Russians sitting on the side of Iran and Syria. I mean, without it, without addressing that Cold War issue, it, it's, you know, you're going to have, you know, the challenges are innumerable. Yes. Entertaining. That political situation. No, no, that's an excellent point. I mean, um, Russia and U.S. relations are key, and uh, uh, President Obama just had a uh, meeting with President Putin specifically on Syria, uh, trying to find a way out, and that's where the gr grand bargain is happening. We're changing from uh, 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 Assad must go now to Assad must go later, and the Russians are moving from, um, okay, maybe Assad could go later. And that's kind of the middle ground that we're finding um, at the very top level of the, of the Cold War, as you call it. And everything down there trickles. Saudi Arabia is not on board. They want Assad's head, and they will not support anybody else. In fact, they're threatening to support um, groups that are not ISIS, but very extreme, that could probably take all that resources and weapons and bring them back to ISIS because they want Assad gone. Turkey is slowly moving away, was very vehemently against Assad. And now it's up to us to, to have that grand bargain with these groups. But at the same time, think about long term. How do we stop that? Are we going to go back there in a couple of years? Do we keep going back? We can't do what we did in Germany and, and, and uh, Japan after World War II. We can't do that. We also, we, what we can do is Bosnia, Kosovo, but even that we don't have resources and money anymore. And we've already spent a lot of blood and treasure in Iraq. So we are, it's not a matter of President Obama or the next president, whoever he is or she is. It's a matter of where we are as a country. Remember, we've got other fish to fry, some very big fish, China, East China Sea. There's a lot going on there um, that we have to work on, and we have other strategic uh, interests that also require very limited resources. Yes. Yes, sir. Question regarding uh, the Kurds in, the, in northern Iraq and northern Syria that fight hard in the nuclear as well. And we've been talking a lot about the Sunni and Shia divide, and is there in your mind a potential for future disenfranchisement of the Kurds as we start this political reform? Yes, I, th I think the kind of the 8,000 pound gorilla in the room is that the Kurds are going to declare the independence in the next uh, five to eight years, and we will all accept it, but nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, they're very effective, the Peshmerga and other uh, three other militia groups that are working very closely with them. Uh, they've done a pretty good job balancing the Shia Sunni. They've, they haven't antagonized anybody. When the Shia militias come, they back off. Uh, when uh, when uh, they're, we're trying to work with the Sunni tribes, for example, they haven't forced themselves into that equation because we're trying to have bilateral talks rather than trilateral, and they're okay with it. 
Um, Turkey is very concerned about the Kurds because, uh, because of their own problem with the Kurds. There's long, long-standing insurgency in their eyes, which is from the Kurdish side is a fight for independence. So Kurds are very important. I would like more concerted effort to support them and their different militia groups because they've done a fairly good job in Syria and Iraq. And I would rather have them than the Iranian-supported Shia militia. But now, now we're going from a consensus to what the U.S. would really like to see. We would definitely want to see less and less Iranian influence. But we like the fact that Iran is on our side in the short term. But in the long term, we want to create a situation where we have our own proxies rather than relying on them. Um, Russia, again, is a wild card, kind of stepped in again in the last couple of weeks and has changed the dynamic. Some, some say it's precisely because P Putin's under a lot of domestic pressure. Sometimes leaders do exactly that. They start a war right before uh, to kind of invoke nationalism. So they start a war outside to um, get people, you know, rally around the uh, commander in chief. He's, he's also under pressure from European sanctions. But I, I, I think that the you know, the Kurds are going to declare the independence in the next five to eight years, or the process is going to be fairly good. They've been able to establish uh, a quasi-state for a long time, and after ISIS, they will be in a much stronger place. That will may be one of the, the bargaining chips they have anyways. Uh, help now with the promise of independence as the price. Just yes? Follow up on the Kurds, uh, Jason Garen from the senior class. Are they willing to not independent in Turkey, because they'd stand a much better chance if they just took eastern Syria, northern Iraq, and made a Kurdistan. I, I don't know much about yeah, it. Yeah, that's a... It seems a, like if they tried to go all... I know, yeah. I, I think they will also have to compromise, uh, um, but have to come up with uh, a better... Uh, there are areas inside countries that are more autonomous. They are constitutional uh, things. So, you know, we've got our own um, tribal lands, for example. We've got countries in Europe that have special protectorates. So they might want to go for something like that short of independence. Uh, I really have to wrap it up, but I'm going to be around here for a few minutes. Uh, I just keep, uh, yeah, John's becoming all red. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could stay here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This was, this was great. Um, thank you for attending.